Greetings, iOS Nation. This is Georgia from Tippy.com, and welcome to our weekly podcast focused on everything iPad, from news and how-tos to app and accessory reviews. This is iPad Live. iPad Live is brought to you by the iPad Accessory Store, your one-stop shop for cases, cables, chargers, and much, much more. Store.tippy.com. See you there. It's Sunday, November 6th, and joining us tonight is the co-host of Iterate and CIO of Nickelfish, Seth Clifford. Hello, How are Georgia. you doing, Seth? I'm doing well. How are you guys? I'm I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Um, I you've been you've been up to some Twitter madness, but I will I will go to that later. Mm, okay. <laughs> also joining us is the editor in chief of Tippy.com and my co-host on Zen and Tech, Renee Ritchie. How's it going, Georgia? I'm good, Renee. I'm good. You were a little bit of partners in crime, so. I, um, I love the T-shirt. Um, is that is that a Jack appearance? Is he doing a special cameo? It is. This is for Ashley. So and I have to remind everybody: we do video now. So if you're only listening to this, you're missing out on like ninety ninety one hundredths, nine tenths of the show. You have to you have to watch the video. We have video on YouTube and in RSS now and in iTunes. So there's no more excuses. And it's so much more fun watching the video. Yes, and you'll see why in just half a second. And our very special guest is the founder and editor-in-chief of The Loop, uh, loopinsight.com, Jim Dalrymple. Hi, guys. <laughs> I'm so happy that after one show, you actually came back to hang out with us again. You know, I've been involved in no badness this week. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a little bit of badness. Well, talking about us getting into trouble... We have our first episode of Girls Gone Gadgets, and I'm I'm watching. I'm wearing a um, Jack shirt just for Ashley. Is she a Nightmare Before Christmas fan? Just a touch. Mm. She had an entire shelf behind her of Nightmare Before Christmas. I am a hardcore Nightmare fan. Maybe yeah. they sh- should have you on Girls Gone Gadgets then. Maybe. <laughs> How do you look in a long blonde wig? Awesome. I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'd be fantastic, too. Jim is smart. Yeah. Well, wait, I'm smart? Oh, yeah. Excellent. Let me write this down. No, it's recorded. <laughs> oh, it's recorded. Yeah, but don't cut that piece out. All I right? won't. I promise. And we also had Chris V, who discussed how he uses his iPhone and iPad as a biology professor. This is interesting. We've been having all the different writers and forum moderators and people who you know, basically work for Mobile Nations telling us how they use their iPhone and iPad on their, in their everyday lives. And Seth was nice enough to write one a couple of years ago, how he uses it as a CIO for a development company. And Chris, Chris Vitek is, a, Vitek is a, a biology professor and he hunts mosquitoes for a living, which sounds like an awesome job. And he uses his iPad instead of textbooks. He uses his iPhone to take photographs. He uses his iPad to control all the equipment in his lab and his, his, I forget, those smart board things in the schools. And they've actually made custom apps in his university to, to, to work with all the different software they use in the, in the science department. It's really cool. So check that out. I He's got all the apps he yeah, uses. Yeah, it's a cool thing to have a professor that's using the tech in order to get you, you know, it's much more relatable. People understand it. And research is right on the fly. Just to have someone standing up in front of you and talking can get quite dull and mundane. And also it deals with the different types of learning. Not everyone learns through just listening or just reading things through text. So be able to interact, see things live, maybe even using AirPlay, using things onto the screen. That will help different readers and different um, different students uh, learn better. So I think that's a wonderful way to um, bridge the gap. And yeah, we're going to have a lot more. We might even get Georgia to write one for us. We'll see. Nice. <laughs> well, someone from the chat room says that perhaps I'm going to be getting the 4S once they fix the battery problem. Ooh. And Jim, you wrote a little article that Apple has confirmed that there is actually battery life issues in iOS 5. Well, here, here's the, the interesting thing about the, the battery issue. I don't have any issues with it. Now, when I first got mine, I, I turned off the location services and I, I turned off, um, oh, I did the, the you know, uh, run it down to zero and then put it all the way back up again, uh, charge it all the way back up. And I haven't had that many issues. I, I don't see many problems now some people 
are, are having really bad issues. They're saying that they don't even touch their phone and it, it, it drains to zero in a couple hours. Obviously, that's an issue. So for those people, Apple said that they found a couple of things in iOS 5 um, that may cause a problem. So they're going to come out with a fix and, you know, hopefully it'll help all of us. Maybe my battery life will get even better. Uh, you know, I, I had the same experience as you, Jim. I didn't have very much of a problem at all. I did turn off a couple of things just because, not really for battery, but I just don't use them. I don't necessarily need my iPhone pinging locations for things. And I've had about the same battery life as my iPhone 4. But we, we get all these complaints and they email us all the time saying, when is Apple going to fix this horrible battery life? Um, so I guess... But did, I believe this happened with previous versions of the X.0 firmwares. I mean, I remember for 3.0, Apple contacted me and asked me to run a battery configuration utility in the background and then collected my information and they were released an update quickly. It's probably just, Seth, is this one of the, the things that happens with a new firmware? Uh, yeah, it has happened. Um, I'd really be curious to know how many of the people that are having the problem restored from a backup from a previous version of iOS 5 or iOS 4, either with their old phone um, running either of those operating systems or, you know, something like that. Because just in talking to people kind of casually, that seems to be uh, a factor that keeps coming up. Like, oh, yeah, I did restore from a backup. Now, I'm not saying that's definitely the reason. Obviously, there's other things at play here. But uh, traditionally speaking, the, the very first version that hits with the new devices, if I recall correctly, there's always some kind of little thing that gets solved in a dot zero dot one shortly thereafter. But I, I'd be curious to know how many people started fresh and how many people actually restored from a backup. Whenever I get a new device, I don't, I don't ever, ever, ever restore from a backup. I usually just start fresh and go from there. And, you know, you and I both restore all yeah. the time anyway, so it's it's never really that big of a deal for me. No, Seth, I, I, I did both. I restored from uh, a backup uh, just a little while ago, and but when I first got it, it was fresh. And, you know, I, I still didn't have issues. And somebody in the chat room, J-Baby, just brought up a, a good point. We shouldn't have to turn off location services. And, and they're exactly right. I don't turn off location services for some apps because I want to try and save a, a bad battery. I turn them off just because I don't use them. Yeah. You know, I, and if I ever am going to use them, then, you know, I would leave those on. I leave on Bluetooth. I leave on Wi-Fi. I leave on location services for most of the apps that, uh, that I use. So, you know, it, it's not a, mad, a matter of, uh, of turning them off to try and save me any kind of power or anything. I also, like, I remember, George, you remember with iOS 3, I think it was the push notifications, and everyone automatically thought push notifications was draining everything and turn off all your push. I, mean, I still keep Facebook push off because there's no way I need those annoying Facebook notifications. But it, it's usually like just whatever new thing Apple puts in gets blamed for the battery loss. Yeah. True. Um, yep. Seth, are you running iOS 5.01 beta 2? And do you notice a difference if you are? No, I actually, I haven't bothered with the beta because uh, I honestly haven't had time to do it. But uh, I figured that it's probably going to get released sooner rather than later. So I'm just going to save that as my first OTA fund. Do you think they're waiting to release it? Because usually they don't do betas, I don't think, for zero dot, like for x.0.1. Do you think it's because of the new storage API, the one that's don't delete it, but don't back it up either, or the Instapaper, or whatever you want to call it, API. That's why Apple's maybe doing the beta? Yeah, I, I forgot about that, and you reminded me this week, and I think that's definitely why they're doing it, because that was something that um, Marco Arment has had a lot to say about, because Instapaper is one of those apps that kind of falls into the gray area that existed just prior to this beta, where you, you his, his document storage for the stuff that you actually download and want to cache on your device couldn't live in either place properly according to what Apple had kind of asked people to do. And so he had written a bit about it, and uh, I believe he had tried to contact people there directly about it. It was Schrodinger's and, data, right? Yeah, it was neither there nor, nor not there, right? And I remember because like one of the guys who runs, uh, one of the guys behind the scenes at Mobile Nations, he's a pilot, he has a small single engine jet, and he was having the same problem because they would load up all their flight information as they were about to take off, iCloud would merrily start to back up and delete all the caching, and then they'd get up in the air and all their charts would be gone. 
Yeah, that's a problem. But uh, wow, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but great. I mean, this, this is all part of that beta. So. Oh, yeah, the beta apparently fixes that too, which is great. Yeah. This is, I just, I think I just saw somebody from Halifax in, in the chat room. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of nice. Actually, somebody, what? somebody right around the corner from me. One of our main writers, Chris Parsons, is in Halifax. He writes for Android Central, Crackberry, and uh, Tippy. Wow. Yeah, you're like a little blogging capital there, Jim. Isn't that something? Yeah, it's amazing. Huh. Most, most people around here want to see me arrested, so, you know. <laughs> they, only because of the vlogging, that's the only... <laughs> yeah. So, we also have uh, the news that uh, Lauren Richter is... He announces, funnily enough, on Twitter that he's leaving Twitter. <laughs> you know, the, the company not actually using the forum, I guess. Right. That's what it means. <laughs> And yeah, he, he had no immediate plans, right? I, I guess not. And it makes, I, you know, I always wonder why would someone leave a company that's doing exceptionally well? Um, he made Tweety, his one-man company. They bought up the company. And, uh, and now he's leaving within a year. So, Renee, what do you, why do you think that someone would leave a company that's, you know, doing exceptionally well to do... I have, sure I have three reasons, and I'm interested to hear your guys' opinion. One is, and people are facetiously saying this the minute he said it, was that his stock divested. Like, he was able to sell his stock and cash out. And who wouldn't? I mean, a lot of people, he's done it. He wants to do something else. Uh, other people were saying that because Twitter, you know, he, he's a very good, very innovative in, interface design guy. And Twitter announced that they were going to standardize everything and take away a lot of the stuff that he'd done. And as a designer, you know, that might irk him enough to seek greener pastures. And the third thing might be that he's been working on Twitter clients since he left Apple. And, uh, you know, we all love Twitter, but it's like a Russian friend of mine used to say, borscht is good, but borscht every night's not so good. And maybe he wants to, like, flex his, flex his wings a little bit. Now, he, when, so when Twitter buys, they, they bought 8-Bits, which was, and he was the only person that works at 8-Bits. And then they end up getting Tweety. They put it into Twitter. Now, they keep the company, but he's gone from the company. So they only pretty much ended up with Tweety and everything that was working on in the company from that on time on. I'm correct with that? Do you, do, you, do you know if they got Twitter for Mac thrown in or is that still his and they just promoted it for him? No, I would imagine that that's all Twitter's. Typically what happens when you buy a company... Oh, we're losing Jim. You'll take the, the lead program or engineer. You're losing me? Yeah, we're losing your audio a little Did you bit. lose me? No, we got you back. Okay. All right, I'm back. Yeah. Um, typically what happens is that when you buy uh, a company, you'll take the engineering team and, you know, you sign them on for a certain amount of time as part of the sale so that you can keep um, the, um, the product moving ahead. But once that time is up, you know, those people can leave. So that, that may be what we're, uh, what we're looking at here with Lauren. Uh, you know, I hope, my, my big fear is we saw what happened when Joe Hewitt left Facebook. It became, you know, update after update of bugginess after bugginess. And it took them a long time to try and give it some direction again. I, I hope it doesn't happen with Twitter because... You know, like Steve Jobs at Apple, the auteur concept is, is very powerful, Seth. Do you think we're going to get uh, the Hewitt factor here? I don't know because I, I'd like to believe that Twitter has already established a much better, um, a much better app platform than Facebook ever had. And I think that, I'd, I'd, again, I'd like to think that they've got a direction in mind and they've got a good enough base to build on that we won't see the kind of horrific releases we've seen from Facebook after Joe Hewitt left. I think that people people expect a little more from them, whether that's you know fair or not. Um, and I think that they're... You know, I think they have their eye kind of on the app experience a little more than Facebook did because Facebook is still very much a web-centric experience regardless of the apps on the devices. And Twitter, while it has a web presence, basically grew from um, all the apps on, and all the third-party stuff that happened around it. So I think that they're very cognizant of that, and I don't think they want to backslide. 
And Facebook had no competition. They were the only one making Facebook for iPhone, where with the i with Twitter, we have TweetBot and Twitterlater and TweetDeck and more Twitter clients than you can throw Angry Birds games at. Yeah. And I, I think that the nice part is that, you know, with tw- Twitter is pretty much established as it is. I think that they, have, they can take a little bit of time and not, you know, change anything that's going to make anything worse. And they'll stay stable for a certain period. I don't think that anyone's really breathing down their neck. Um, do you think that, that who's the biggest... Uh, what application would be something that Twitter is not doing? And Friendster make is better? making a comeback. I hate the way you people just dismiss it out of hand. Really? Do you think <laughs> Friendster? It's 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 hot. Are you are you jumping board to Friendster, Renee? I'm jumping back. I'm going to revive my old account. Who's what? No, Jim's just shaking his head in utter disbelief. <laughs> Seth's like, I'm there right now. You, you no, know, I'm gonna, totally I, not. I'm going to pick up a guitar and just start playing. When you guys come back to reality, I'll join in. <laughs> it's okay. I'm still stuck on the Google Wave, so I'm not even there. I'm not even doing a social network. I'm just... Yeah, like, you know, for a while, Jim, it was funny. We saw all the trendy kids jumping onto Google+, Plus, but talking about it on Twitter, it doesn't seem like anyone has fielded a, a realistic competition for it yet. No, it, it, Google Plus is an interesting thing. I mean, I get so many followers on Google Plus, but I don't really post anything there uh, besides, you know, what I post on the website. I, I, I haven't really found a place for it yet. And, yeah. and that's kind of, uh, it's kind of bothersome, really, to have a resource where I can, you know, reach out and, 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 talk to readers and interact with people, but it just doesn't seem like there's much interaction. So I, I haven't figured out a place for it yet. Twitter is the main place where, where I go. Yeah, Twitter's like the water cooler. I'm not quite sure what Google Plus is yet. The, the community swimming pool? I mean, like, it's a lot of fun, but you don't go there that often? Yeah, and you don't, <laughs> you don't, you don't pee in Twitter. I, mean. <laughs> I think That's the idea astute. behind Google Plus is solid. I think that it's... A, it's a good system, and I like the things that it does, but I just don't find myself going there. I, I, it just feels like every time I log in, there's so much stuff to go through that I just get disinterested and stop. Here's my problem, and I know it's going to ring a lot of alarm bells for Georgia, but Google Plus really... It it keeps smacking me in the face as an identity grab. Like I go there and it says, oh, you better give me your phone number because if your account gets stolen, you won't be able to. And it tries to scare me into giving it more and more. Or it shows me, like Twitter just asks, it never strong arms me. I just go there, I use it. But both Facebook and Google Plus keep trying to find out more about me. No matter how hard I try, they keep throwing these roadblocks of information in front of me. And since you know that Google's main purpose is to sell information in order to advertise to us better, it, it is a little bit more frightening in that way, whereas Twitter, it's just a place where you can go. Plus, Twitter has been around for so much longer that you already know that most people, if they're going to use a type of social networking, information, water cooler-like thing, people are already there. And Google, though it has um, you know, the name in, to, in which to back to bring people in, it's still that more people are on Twitter that are than are on Google Plus. So I've never you know, sent a beer joke to Jim on Plus, but I've sent plenty on Twitter. I think that's <laughs> <laughs> so. That's it's true. it's just the easier way to go. It's hard to gain momentum. I don't know what Seth had for breakfast on Google Plus, but I can find out on Twitter. Right. They need to to have some sort of you know giveaway or you know something to pull more people in if they're going to want to actually have it work as a social network. Because in the end, if there's no social, then there's no network. You know what I think a lot of the, the good stuff about Twitter is, is that it's just so simple. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. 140 characters. You say what you want uh, in as short a span of characters as you can, and you post it. And, you know, people respond to it or don't. I mean, it's very easy. All of these other uh, social networking sites have so much to them. Yeah. You know, you, you, you post pictures and you do this and, you know, you have a basic, basically you have a website and you have to take care of it and you have to update it. And Twitter doesn't care. You know, Twitter, you can update with anything, anytime, and it just doesn't care what you say. So the other interesting thing is the Twitter and iPhone seem to go together like peanut butter and and chocolate, or to put it in Seth and Jim parlance, like beer and pretzels. It just—it seems like such a good fit. Whereas Google's iOS apps to date have been 
almost like miniature web design train wrecks and that like you they send you to horrible login screens they're they they don't support multiple accounts they don't look right they don't work right uh, and like the gmail app this week i mean it was just that was just more of the same it doesn't feel like a good experience oh that was terrible did you try it jim because I, I i couldn't get past the constant notification errors I did try it, and I, I. It's funny because as soon as I I posted, I actually posted something on Google Plus, and and Robert Scoble contacted me and said it's terrible. You know, <laughs> he, he said I already deleted it, and I said yeah, yeah, okay, fine, I'm going to try it anyway. So I I downloaded it and and tried it, and I deleted it. Yeah, I mean it, it's a it works great. Google stuff is phenomenal. They make the they make the best web apps in the world. All the stuff. I mean, they they do have issues with multiple account support. I'm hoping they nail that. But if you're just in a single Google app with a single Google account, fantastic. But when they do the apps for some reason, they I don't really know how to make Android apps. Just get those smart people to make the iOS apps already. But somebody brought up something on Twitter last week uh, when this whole thing started. And they made a good point. You know, beta for most companies is is uh, releasing an app to the public so that it can be tested. Beta for Google is finished. You know, <laughs> get it out there. The five year beta. It's like a Battlestar Galactica <laughs> voyage of a beta. Yeah. Release version is Earth, and they're they're still going there. <laughs> so we have all kinds of crazy rumors that are going around at all times. One that seems just a little bit a little bit crazier than the usual one is that Apple is going to redesign the iPad, the iPhone, the MacBook Air, everything. And the for... Louvre. I think the Louvre as well. <laughs> Maybe the Coke can. Now we get a lot of rumors from Digitimes. Renee, what have you run the statistics on how accurate they usually are? You know, we're going to go back to this again. They are a randomly accurate, an accidentally accurate rumor site. I f Kevin, More than chance. Kevin once had a monkey flipping coins and put it up against analyst predictions, and the monkey flipping the coin was as accurate as often as these analyst-based rumors. So, uh, I mean, if, if Jim had posted it, I would give it full faith and credence. But uh, the sketchy sources that come from suppliers familiar with people who know component upstream briefed on the matters... Um, I don't know. There's, there's, you know what, you, you know what this comes down to. Somebody comes out in 2011 and said Apple is going to redesign their their products in 2012. Come on, <laughs> you know. Okay, and the sun is going to shine sometime in the next two months. You know, I, I mean, of course they're going to redo their products in in 2012. They always redo their products and. You can say that they didn't completely overhaul them, but the the rumors can say, well, we didn't say they were going to completely yeah. overhaul them. We just said that they were going to redesign them. It's and in white. Look, this <laughs> bu this button moved. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's a redesign. So, I mean, these things are all worded so that nobody ever gets in trouble and nobody is ever wrong. And But it doesn't tell us anything. I mean, you know, to say it's, it's like saying Apple is going to release uh, a new Mac sometime in 2012, a new iPad sometime in 2012. Well, of course they are. I mean, if you read between the lines of a lot of the stuff that's uh, uh, that's written, it, it's just so sad. Right, and so a lot of times, DigiTimes is like that. Their brother's friend's cousin's factory working uncle. Yeah, yeah. And and he knows a guy in the uh, parts department <laughs> down at the you know local store, and he says that they're going to change them. Uh, we don't know to what extent that's going to be. So I I didn't even report on any of that stuff because it was just so wide open. I, I felt like just saying you know, duh, stop yeah, it. stop it. That's what you wanted to say, right, Jim? Yeah. It could, but you know, it's what's funny is even when these. Like that, like hard candy spent, I forget what the guy said, 10 grand or 15 grand of money to make iPhone 5 cases for a design that was never, ever released. And that was all based on the leak of a prototype. Uh, and we saw that too with the iPad 2. The iPad 2 was leaked and some people got arrested over that. So, I mean, these, these things do happen, but it's, 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 not, it's not news. It's just not no, that that kind of stuff isn't. I I kind of laughed. I got to tell you when uh, when that thing about the case designer came out, 
you know, that he, he lost all that money trying to put something for a design that hadn't even been released. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and not not even, the, I think that it take, doesn't take into account the amount of money that it would cost um, Apple to redesign anything that's already working. And I don't see any reason why they would feel that, um, you know, they definitely will be re- hopefully redesigning a phone in the future. And they do make similar design changes in, in a m- minimalistic way. But it costs a lot of money to redesign things. I don't think they really care about what the case makers, how much they put into different design changes. But they might be using prototypes, and that's where Digitimes is taking a look at this. But They're probably messing with them by now. Let's make three different prototypes, and we'll leak two of them, and we'll see what I... I'd have fun with that. Well, that's that's the whole thing with these with the prototypes. Apple is testing everything. I mean, they tested seven inch iPads, they tested ten inch iPads, and Steve came to the conclusion that ten inch was the best. Um, that's why they came out with what they did. They've got uh, prototypes of of everything and different size computers, different iPhones. They had CDMA iPhones uh, on campus. Uh, you know, a year before they were released because they had to test them all out. So, you know, for, for somebody to come out and say um, that they're going to release this or they're going to do that, I mean, it just, it irks me sometimes because I, I, I just want to slap them in the <laughs> face. <laughs> all slapping aside, they are trying to innovate and make things better all the time. I think that you wrote a beautiful um, article on making the impossible possible, which Apple does so um, eloquently. Um, if you oh, yeah, that was the laser one, right? Jim, with the, the little... Yeah, for the, yeah. the little life. And it is, it's amazing what the, the time and effort that Apple puts into something as simple as uh, the computer light to let you know that the um, light is is being used onto your your sorry the camera is being used on your computer. Yeah, and it, and it's those little things that that's why we we like using Apple products. Uh, even if you're not you know a diehard Mac user or anything like that, it's those little details that really bring you in. I mean, they brought uh, a manufacturing people, and Johnny Ive did to figure out a way to get green laser lights to shoot out of, of aluminum, you know, and, and it's just, it's kind of crazy that that's the extent that they'll go to, uh, to make things work. They'll go sleep. Well, yeah, that, that thing we talked about on iterate, right, Seth, the ten three one Apple will make like, what is it again? They have, uh, they have basically 10 designs that they start with, then they kind of whittle it down to three, and then they land on one after some really rigorous uh, discussions and testing. But, I mean, and that's... That's, expen- that's an expensive approach. Yeah, definitely. It yeah. takes time, it takes people, it takes a heck of a lot of you know interaction between a lot of different people and a lot of different thinking to get to that point where some people basically start with one and just keep pushing it in a direction and it kind of gloms onto other stuff and things get bolted to it and at the end it doesn't really look like what it started with. Now there, that that was perfect. Gloms and bolted. I mean, that that just, that fits so many products perfectly right there. A whole, whole ranges of netbooks right there, Jim. Yeah. yeah. And they said Johnny Ive actually goes and sleeps, uh, like not on the factory floor, but he and his team go right next to the factory and keep an eye on everything. And they really, it's that story of Steve Jobs and his father, where his father made sure the back of the fence looked great just because he would know. And that was echoed with Johnny Ive saying that he and Steve would spend weeks working on, the, on a part of a product that no one would even see because they knew it was there. Yeah. They do. They definitely do a really great job at working at so that something has form, function, and aesthetics, yeah. which is nice to see. To take the time when they when they first came out with say the unibody um, uh, aluminum casing, that was just impressive to see. Like to, I actually watched exactly how it was designed and how they made it, which is not something that I would normally aluminium. be interested. In. Aluminium. Yeah, <laughs> and I was so impressed. I was like, that is brilliant the way that they do all of that and having. You know, all the little things being so, like, so simple. And after you use it, you can't go back. Well, look at the iPad 2 and even the iPhone 4 and 4S. These are designs that are going on, you know, one one is six, seven months old. The other one's over a year old. And they're still best in class. I mean, other people make good designs too, but I don't think anyone has equaled the manufacturing that are behind those devices. 
It's true. I love I love my air. Yeah, I, I, I have an 11 and a 13. And they're great. Yeah, except for the fact of the it doesn't have the backlit keyboard. Yeah, she got, that the, she got the first gen. Jim. I do. It's, that's a little bit sad. I, I it it pulls me towards a new one. <laughs> yeah, it it does. Does. That's why they did it. But there was that that article too that talked about how Apple and you know Tim Cook has spoken about this before. How Apple, Jonathan I doesn't just design that MacBook. He designs the equipment that makes that MacBook, and then Apple finances that equipment for the factory, so they have access to technology to build computers that no one else can build at prices no one else can match. And all those billions of dollars that the analysts keep asking them to give back in dividends and buy back in stock, they invest in factories and production and make products that are two three years. Is that right, Jim? Two, three years in the future? Oh, well, they have. I mean, when you talk about companies needing to have a long-term plan, uh, companies do have, have long-term plans, but Apple, it's not as detailed as what Apple's is. So Apple has a long-term detailed plan on, on how they're going to make them, how they're going to uh, uh, ship them. I mean, look at what, what Jobs did uh, when the first iMac came out. Uh, he bought up all the cargo uh, space on planes so that they could fly the, the IMAX in for the holidays when everybody else, all the other companies tried to, uh, to ship their products. They couldn't because Steve, Steve had spent $50 million to, to, sh to buy up all the cargo space. It was like so, great. There was that great story too about the HP guy watching his i his iPod whatever being shipped around the world and realizing that Apple was shipping them all individually and he yeah. said he had an oh bleep moment when he saw how how Apple was handling the deliveries. Yeah, I mean those again those are details that you know you don't expect to to order uh, an iPod or an iPad or a computer and be able to watch it ship around the world. You expect that it's going to, you know, show up in a week or two weeks or shipping delay three weeks, you know, and all that. That's what most companies do. That's not what Apple does. And it was, it was not just that Apple did it, but when the guy said that they went to buy shipping and Jobs had bought it all, they, he, he was thinking so far ahead that it hadn't even occurred to them to do that. Yeah, well, they were trying to ship like now. Yeah, <laughs> and you we know, better do some shipping. Has anyone got any shipping yet? We'll use FedEx. <laughs> and Steve had already bought it yeah. all. I mean, what forward thinking that is to say, damn, yeah. hey, we get fifty million bucks. Let's blow it up, and you know, out the door it goes. I think one of the best things that Apple does, and, and the reason that they're able to spend such time into d in detail on each product they make, is by cutting down the amount of products that they put out. They're able to spend a lot of detail, make sure that everything is exceptionally good in working order, because they don't have a gazillion products that they're trying to push out there every single second. They have a whole bunch of people working on a small number of products, and they can uh, do a good job with it, spend the money to fully... They don't have to rush it. They don't have to get it out next time. They have a full plan on when it's going to be out. Everyone knows. Everyone's getting prepared. You know when to save up your money for when, and the products are of good quality. I mean, the Zoom came out. in. We saw the Zoom at CES, and it came out after that, and now they've got a Zoom 2 already in the pipe, and we probably won't see an iPad 3 until, until like a year after the iPad 2. So Apple is really much more methodical than the competition at releasing stuff. Well, and Apple does it on their schedule. You know, they release things when they feel that it's necessary to update the product. They do the same thing with stores. You know, they wait for a specific building to, to become available so that they can rent it or buy it. They do long-term leases on it so that, you know, they'll never have to move. So, you know, that's that's what it comes down to. you got to be prepared for that stuff, and App, Apple seems to be. Well, that was that story, too, about Jobs in the empty house because he was patient enough to wait for the furniture he wanted. He did, just didn't feel the need to fill it with a bunch of crap. Yeah. Anyways, I don't want to. I want to ask Jim's opinion on what do you think about this new Apple Store app, Jim, where they say that you'll be able to just pick up a case and walk out and you won't be tackled by anybody? The, the new Apple Store app? Yeah, that's what the rumor is, that you'll be able to... Well, one of them is that you'll, you'll buy the thing on the Apple Store app, walk into the store, and it'll be ready and waiting for you, and you sign for it. But also things like the cases, you might be able to just scan the case and buy it with the app and not have to deal with a human at all. I think that'd be pretty cool. I mean, we're, we're getting to the point now with, with 
stuff like this that you're going to be able to do things like that. I mean, you can walk in now uh, after buying something online, walk into a store and pick it up and, you know, walk out again. Um, so, I mean, over the next couple of years, the, the number of things that we're going to be able to do is just going to be incredible. George, how do, you, how do they stop people from just walking out with cases, though? I'm not sure. Again, any time that it has to do with security and that people having more and more of my personal information on file along with credit card, it does give me a little bit of pause. And I think that it ends up having people that will be able to um, not just steal, say, um, you know, some celebrities' naked pictures, but then all of their credit card information through the app, app that might have some sort of bug in it. Seth, am I being a little bit over paranoid with this, or is it something that we have to up our security to match with the tech? Like, it's great to do it, but. You Are know, you saying you have naked secret. pictures of me? <laughs> <laughs> she will by the end of the I, show, Jim. Sh- I can't say. Well, Fine. truthfully, I, I trust the tech a lot more than I trust people. I think that uh, I'm more concerned about the person that walks away with my credit card out of sight than I am with, you know, 256-bit encryption on a website because people are less predictable. People will do things you don't expect. And, you know, are you wrong to worry about stuff? No, I don't think you're wrong to worry about it. But it's a trade-off. You know, it's you, you give up certain things and then you get certain things as a result of that. So if you want to have these kinds of frictionless experiences with your technology that, you know, these companies want to provide, then you kind of have to reach a point of comfort where you're willing to give up certain things and not worry about it. And, you know, I guess at a certain level, trust that your information is going to be protected, but you're not wrong to, to question it or, or to worry about it. I don't it, like you know? Georgia not being wrong rants of yours, Seth. Oh, be quiet. You can't <laughs> always be right. Uh, I, I I wonder if the credit card companies are going to decide if you choose to put your, because they, they cover us if our credit card is, say, stolen in a personal interaction. They will cover you for, um, you know, after a certain amount, depending as long as you check it out within the month. I wonder if there will be a null and void if you choose to put your credit card information onto an application and then have that information stolen. Are the credit card companies going to be okay with that? Or are they going to be like, well, wait a second, we didn't really sign on for this? Well, they didn't do that when we when we went online to buy things. True. You know, so I, I don't see how they could really do that. I mean, there's so much competition these days for for credit cards and for banks and things like that that I I, I, I personally I think that they're just happy that you're using it and willing to spend. Well, that's true. the thing. Like Apple, uh, again, it was a rumor, and the rumor was that Apple expected a 30% bump in sales by making it very easy to buy with the app, and the credit card company gets their percentage of that. So I think overall, they're just counting their heaps of money. Yeah. <laughs> the ungodly heaps of money. Now, I've gotten um, Guitar Smith. I've just uh, tried it out, and now Apple has released Garage Band for the iPhone and iPod Touch. Now, I am, a tr- you know, I, I know that... What's that, below that, noob? Is there, a, there, is there something below noob, guys? I know, just, <laughs> just learning how to hold the, the guitar. I know Seth and, and you, Jim, are also really good with the, gra- uh, with the guitar. Is, is GarageBand going to be something that I should be able to use at a level of zero yeah, with my iPhone? Abs- absolutely. I mean, on your Mac, on your iPhone, on, on your uh, iPad, definitely. It's very easy to use. And and Seth, have you used it? And have you used it on your iPhone as of yet, if you have? Yeah, I have. I've had it for the iPad for a while, and it's great. I don't, I don't play with it as much as I'd like to, but every time I open it, it's just so enjoyable. And I actually, since it came out for the iPhone, I had to try it just to see, because in my mind, I'm used to... You know, a huge screen with all kinds of, you know, sliders and things and controls. And I thought, I, I have to know how GarageBand translates to the iPhone interface because I thought about it for so long. It's phenomenal. It's absolutely great. And it works exceptionally well on the 4S because, the, you know, it's just so quick. There's no, there's no delay in anything. And I actually just tested it the other day with um, just a little quick multi-track. Like I just recorded a couple vocal tracks and just kind of layered them to see how it went. And it was unbelievable. It was it was shocking to me that you could do that so quickly on your phone that uh, I, I can't wait to dig in and play with it a lot more. 
So for someone that has never picked up a guitar before, <laughs> would this be a frightening a manner to go about learning and using the guitar, or should I dive right in and give it a shot? Dive right in. Yeah, seriously. You're not going to get and hurt. I, Is there auto-tune in like GarageBand for her? For her guitar. Yeah. <laughs> I like how you put the iPhone 4S is amazing with it, too, in there, Seth. I heard that. Well, I have to I have to dig in where I can, you know? But Jim, I think, in the chat room was saying that he likes the iPad better. I, I do like the iPad version a bit better just because it's bigger. Yeah. And, you know, you, you, have, um, you have a lot more room, a lot more real estate to move things around. And I just like it a bit better. Do you because you you have all sorts of fancy stuff, Jim? Do you still use GarageBand, or is are you way up in the pro level? Well, no, I still use GarageBand. I I just installed tonight. I just installed Pro Tools ten. Um, I have Logic Pro. Um, I have Cubase. Uh, everything you know, I I use it all, and I I like it. Uh, but I still use GarageBand too. GarageBand is a good uh, scratch pad. You know, I come down, I want to record something real quick. I'll turn on GarageBand and just, you know, get a track enabled and, and play before I lose it. You know, I have yep. it in my head. I want to get it down as quickly as possible. GarageBand is usually what I use for that. Uh, yes. And then I, then I can just listen to that riff and I open up Pro Tools and, you know, I'm there. Yeah, you posted on, on your guitar setup and you use the iPad for writing songs onto it. And you put down all the different products that you use for that. Yeah, I, a lot of people think that, you know, when they get a, an iPad, you know, they hear in the news and, and the, on websites that, you know, people are writing songs on their iPads and that's what they should be doing too. They should be writing songs on it. I, I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I don't always sit down and write songs on my iPad. Uh, a lot of times I sit down and, and practice, you know, I, I sit down and just play. And if something comes to me, then I'll press record. But otherwise, you know, I don't sit down with the, uh, uh, with the goal of I'm going to write a song only on my iPad. I'm never going to use a Mac or I'm not going to use my iPhone. And I, I think people do that and, and they shouldn't. Yeah. They should, they cool, should right? sit down. Do you, yeah. Do you use your iPad and you hook it up to your guitar? Yes. Actually, Jim recommended, I, we started a new music, like a, a music, a DJ, and a jamming forum, and we we're looking for something to give away, and Jim recommended the Apogee Jams, and we're giving that away right now, and people are excited, Jim, it was a good pick. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of the best interfaces out there. I think Seth secretly covets it. No, I do. I, I looked at that post and was like, man, that is, that's what I need. That's what I need because I use the, the iPad and the iPhone exactly the same way. I've been using smartphones and just voice memos and things like that for audio scratch pads for years and years and years. And I would actually end up recording multiple tracks as different memos and then have to like open them all up and play them to remember what I was thinking. So just to be able to do it on the iPad with GarageBand just so quickly so I don't forget the thing that I'm walking around humming in my head and I can get it yeah. out, it's so great to have that. And then if you want to, if you, you could even bounce it over and work with the same files on your machine if you want to, but just to be able to capture not just the one part of it, but I mean, I think in terms of like harmonies and things like that, and I don't want to lose the other parts because somebody will say something and it'll just be gone. So being able to multi-track easily is indispensable. And if you want your own, we are doing a giveaway for Apogee Jam. Um, I'll send down the um, link. Um, and all you have to do is uh, head on over to our contest thread, and you can have it for yourself. Well, and the thing about the jam, I mean, we're, we're all talking about it, using it for the iPhone and iPad. It comes with a, with a cable to plug into your Mac as well. So you can use it all over the place. I mean, you can sit down and start to write a song on, on your iPad or be jamming and, you know, decide that you, you like that. Uh, send the song to your computer and then take the jam with you and plug it in and keep going right there. I use hey, Jim? App. Yeah. D does the jam have like a little preamp built into it? Uh, well, how do you mean? I mean, you, you can't, it, it's not a, um, 
uh, what am I trying to say? XLR, you know, it's it's only for the guitar. So yeah, once you plug it in, USB straight in or to the bottom of the uh, to the iPhone. So it has everything you need and powered right from there. It's a one stop okay. interface. Yeah. I just didn't know. I didn't know how much of the level came through. I guess obviously, if you like it, it's it's a pretty solid device. Well, here's the thing. You know, on a on a guitar, when you're playing through an amp, if you turn the volume way down on your guitar. No, the amp tone uh, of your music will will become more mellow, but if you crank up the the volume, then you know you're looking at uh, a crunchier sound. So when right. I plug in, when I plug into my Marshall, um, you know it's a it's a big crunchy sound. <laughs> um, the jam has a gain uh, uh, volume on the side, so it acts just like the volume on the guitar. So okay. you can you can turn the gain down. And, you know, it mellows out your guitar. And then you crank the gain rate up and you get a nice, hard, crunchy sound. I guess that's what I was asking. I didn't know if there were controls on there to boost right on the device itself. So that's good. Ah, yeah. yeah. Nice. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what you get. You have that, that, uh, that one volume that you can go for. Okay, cool. We have our tips of our picks of the week. Um, Chris Aldroyd had the Brody car mount. You can take a peek at that. Um, Seth, I have to ask. I've been waiting to ask. <laughs> what is Seth, this? Seth, your pick is cat paint. You're kidding me, <laughs> right? That is the funniest thing ever. What is cat? I have to know. What is cat paint? <laughs> well, George, I'm glad you asked. Cat paint is the premier cat image base editor that uh, you can get on your iOS device. And uh, the, I don't even really recall how I found it. I, it was a completely <laughs> random thing that I came across. I think I was just looking for photography apps, and it was one of the, like, you know, best-selling ones. Wow. And, uh, really? I, yeah, I looked at it, and the, the icon for it is this really big, fat cat, and it just has the word meow really big on it. So I started laughing when I saw it, and then I clicked into it, and the claims of how great the app is were so fantastic that I had to download it and it was a universal app and then it just so happened that at the time I was talking to uh, Michelle and Adam from Crackberry and we were talking about silly pictures and then Blaze jumped in and so I showed them and it became this whole thing and so the reason I made it my pick is because I was very busy last week it was very stressful and every time I open that app, I laugh, and it's hysterical. So I figured I would share. <laughs> Jim, do you I remember think, when James... I think I might just get it just because of that, Seth. It's, it's so ridiculous. Jim, do you remember I love when, it. Do you remember when James Thompson released Twitter Kitty? No. <laughs> and he, made, he made a Twitter app, just James uh, Thompson from Peacock, for people in the, in the chat room. He uh, released a, an app just for cats to tweet, and they had very big buttons, and the cat could put its paw on them and Twitter... <laughs> Uh, it, it did not take the app store by storm, but uh, I'm sure there is a market for lolcat derived applications somewhere. <laughs> I'm not sure where. Cat, but... Cats and the internet. This, it, it is this everywhere. App, this app allows you to place cats on pictures or take a new picture and place cats. And then with the cats, they can then fire lasers out of their eyes. I'm, I love it. I love yeah. it. What else do you need? Way to cats drive me lasers. back to the Android market there, Seth. Thanks. <laughs> I'm going I'm to speed through the rest of them because we're somewhat running out of time. So we have assistive touch from George Lim. It is um, that his sleep-wake button decided to stop working, so he found a way around. Built-in accessibility features. Good way to go, Apple. Yes, for sure. Um, from, I'm going to try to say, um, from at Asus. Adam Zeiss. Adam Zeiss. Sorry. Weather Alert USA. Um, Sonos from Jared. J.I. Where is that exactly? Sonos. Hmm. Sonos is everywhere. It's a controller. For the Sonos music system. You put it in different rooms of your house and you can use the app to control which music comes out of which room of your house. Sweet. Instapator yeah. 4 from Renee. And my own Siegecraft. We also have Newsstand from Ali Flowers. WordPress from Liana. Welder from Ali. And all these are in the show notes if you can't keep up with George's lightning pace. Sorry, my apologies. Great jitters. It's a puzzle game from M.G. Miller. It's one of our first choice. And you can send in your own choices, and Leanna may choose you to go up on the page as well. 
and just a quick shout out and a thank you to Marco Armand when we he he did a uh, he he did us a solid and made the tippy look much nicer in Insta Paper and I really appreciate that. He's a gentleman. Nice. Yeah. And a scholar. I would also like to show off my beautiful uh, Draco case. This one is the Jewel Beetle, and it is. I don't know if the camera lighting will do it justice, but it does change colors from a green to a blue to a purple, and I absolutely love it. Very nice. Thank you. She could kill somebody with that phone now. Yes, and some people asked if it goes over the bezeling on the phone. It does just a little minute bit. So if you place it down on a table, as long as the table is flat, no, it will not scratch. You will not have any scratches. So it covers a little bit. Does It is much more protective than not having your phone on. And I ha- I'm not sure about if it's going to cause any battery. I've, I've been up and down. I'm going to have to do some tests to see. Antenna, if my- you mean? Yeah, I'm sorry. George, Georgia, is that, uh, is that your 4S? Ouch. That, that hurts, Jim. That hurts. That hurts. I see everyone else is giggling with glee over that. It, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not giggling with glee. It was, was just an asking. honest question. It was, it's an honest it was question. Just, it, was, yeah. it was just he's evil. Interested. There was no glee. It was he just, was, he's interested. <laughs> I just, just want cares. the best. I just want the best for you. That's all. Aww. Well, I'm, I'm touched that you care. Thank you. I'm sure that I'll have another hundred Twitter people asking me after if uh, we're so there. Also want to let you know that if you have been using your camera, we have a full set of camera tips that you can take a look at at www.tippy.com slash camera dash tips. Yeah, so Leanna's been knocking them out the park. She's got, a, she's got a, a baby daughter and any excuse that she can find to take pictures of that cute little girl, she is doing it. She's cropping. She's, she's uh, enhancing. She's doing everything possible with the iPhone 4S camera. And you know, I asked on Twitter if um, actually I'm going to say that for Wednesday because George is dragging me into an iPhone sh- talk on an iPad show. It's like she always does. Sorry, I had to show it off. I, I love. I apologize. I apologize. Show off your you iPad case. So I well, see, I don't really. I just have here. She has a dodo skin on still. I think. No, I have no, my, Oh, the fiber. Carbon yeah, fiber. carbon fiber. Carbon. Do you use a case on your iPad, Jim? Uh, I have one of the Apple cases. You know the 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 clip on the flip ones. You yeah. know. Whatever they're called, smart smart covers. S- smart cover, yeah. I have one of those, uh, and really like it actually. I, I don't usually use a case on my iPhone, although I do have a case right now for my 4S, and this is uh, a battery pack more than uh, a case. Nice. You know, it's one of the Mophie things. Yeah. So. Uh, I use that more for the for the battery than a case, but I never I've never used a, a case. Why is there no giant Mophie for the iPad yet? Mophie, where's my iPad extended battery case? Can you that imagine? Would be enormously <laughs> large. Yeah, you'd need one of those little red wagons to carry it around. <laughs> <Little in>. <laughs> <And> <laughs> make it so heavy. And, and right now, my little red wagon carries cases of Heineken around <laughs> wherever I go, so I don't have that much time. It's like Calvin and Hobbes. Just instead of Hobbes, there's Heineken. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nice. Well, unless there is anything else, uh, Renee, I think that we are good to go. Do it. All right. I would like to say thank you very much to Seth for joining us today and for um, all the wonderful people you've sent my way to ask me about if I have my iPhone for us. <laughs> uh, thank you, Georgia. Thanks for having me. And I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Plead the fifth. Smart way to go, Seth. Smart way to go. Um, how can we find you? How, how can we find you if we so wish to have any retribution, perhaps in a week or so? If you want to dole out righteous retribution for reasons unbeknownst to me, you can, furious me anger. <laughs> you can follow me on Twitter at Seth Clifford. Uh, you can find me on the other Tippy show, iPhone Live. You can find me on Iterate with Renee and Mark Edwards of Bajango. And if you'd like to see some of the apps and sites that we build, our website is nfidm.com. We're Nickelfish. Damn it. These are my little tiny Vader fists. <laughs> <laughs> and I would also like to thank Jim so much for joining us today. And um, I'm sh- almost shocked that you came back after the first show. <laughs> You know, like I said, before we get started, I'm I'm surprised you guys had me back, but 
I, I loved it. You've got a, a great bunch of people in the uh, in the chat room, and they're you know they're a lot of fun to interact with during the show. And you guys are great as hosts, so you know I'll uh, I'll come back anytime. We we do have some of the best chat people. They they yeah. are amazing. How how can we find you, Jim? Um, I just posted on uh, in the chat room. You can find me at. Um, at Jay Dalrymple on, on Twitter and loopinsight.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us again. And Renee. Yes. Another show. Yes, in the can. Another show in the can. Do you know what your numbers are even at at this stage? How many shows we've done? Yeah. Uh, I think you've done about 100. I think I'm c- close to around 300 and something now. It's a lot Maybe. of it's yeah. a lot of shows. So how can how can we find you? You can find me at Renee Ritchie. You can find me at tippy.com and you can find us at mobile nations slash shows. We are doing ooh, I don't know, close to a dozen. We just launched Girls Gone uh, Gadgets, and we're gonna be launching three more shows in the next few weeks or months. So um, yeah, keep keep an eye out. It's wild and crazy. And um, yeah, if you haven't already checked checked out Girl Gone Gadget, please do. You can find me on Twitter at Georgia T-I-P-B. Um, if you are, you know, suddenly going to be following me, um, I, I don't have an iPhone for us yet. I'm just saying it out there. I, I heard I'm rumors. She, ask. She, also, she also doesn't like scary clowns. Yes. Oh, I don't. I really don't. And there's like a whole plethora of scary <laughs> clown avatars that seem to be following me now. One more scary than the other. Which is so strange. I don't know. It's a circus Be trooper. Be careful that, out, of that Twitter guy named It. I just, he's up to no good. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then they send me a little like message so that I, I get to actually see their avatar. You can reach all of us at Tippy via email at podcast at tippy.com. Leave a comment when the show goes live, please. We're here every Sunday night at 6 p.m. Eastern. Nine, sorry, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, 2 a.m. British summertime. And our companion show, Renee iPhone Live, Wednesday night, same bat time, same bat channel. www.tippy.com slash live for all our podcasts, including, take a deep breath, <gasps> iPhone Live, iPad Live, Zen and Tech, Super Functional, Iterate, and Girls Gone Gadgets. See mobilenations.com. If you haven't already, subscribe to all our shows on iTunes and leave a rating. It helps people find the show and uh, makes us less than three. Um... Thank you so much to, do we still thank to, may I? Yeah. We'll add that later. And to the Tippy iPhone Accessory Store for sponsoring the podcast and to everyone who showed up to the live chat. It's so much more fun with everyone showing up live. So if you haven't ever shown up live, show up live. And if it's your first show that you've come live to, let us know. We'll give you a we actually out. had some people asking why they couldn't see the chat in the video. And I have to explain the chat is for live people. It is for the dedicated hardcore fans. It's that's the, that's the thing you get for showing up live. That's your bonus. And we do. We, we try to interact. Jim will even talk back to you. Can. <laughs> yes, Carolyn says that she cannot find the Girls Gone Gadgets in iTunes as of yet. No, it takes a it takes a while. You know, we'll do we'll do a post on how podcasts work. But basically, you create an RSS feed and you submit it to iTunes, and iTunes reviews it the same way they review apps. So it usually it takes a few days. Uh, before it pops up on iTunes, but you can grab the RSS for now, and it will auto magically appear as soon as iTunes reviewers are done with it. That would be a good. That would be a good post. I'd like to see that. Oh, okay, yeah, we're actually going to write up uh, how we do the live show. We'll write, we'll write up almost everything. Yeah, good idea. And if you ever want us to write up something or have a question, go ahead and ask. Um, it always helps out other people. And if you're wondering, probably a lot of other people are as well. Yeah. That's it. I think that uh, that's all she wrote for today. 